located on the banks of the Royal Canal. I'm here at the town's most storied landmark, the Great Maynooth Castle, which overlooks the entrance to the south campus of the university. There are two massive towers remaining from the original castle, and over the archway through one of them is the coat of arms of the Fitzgeralds, a dynasty which ruled over Kildare for centuries. And looking closely at the figures on either side of the coat of arms, you will make out the weathered features of a creature which transpires to be, of all things, a monkey. Well, the story goes as follows. Many, many generations previously, a Fitzgerald child was asleep in his cot in a Fitzgerald castle. He was the heir to the throne. The floor covering of the time was of straw, and there was a candle in the room, and the straw caught fire. But there was a pet monkey in a cage in the room. And with the crackling of the fire, the monkey began to screech and to wail. And that alerted the adults in the other part of the castle who rushed up, saw the impending disaster and rescued the child and secured the succession of the Fitzgerald dynasty. The castle itself traces its origins to the late 1100s, when the first fortification was put in place by the first Fitzgerald Barden to settle in the area of Welsh origins. His foundation was extended, and over successive generations of the family, developed into one of the finest fortresses in Ireland. It probably reached its zenith in the reign of Garrod Moore, the 8th Earl of Kildare. In fact, he was so powerful that the English king, Henry VII, was afraid of him. He said, if Ireland cannot rule Fitzgerald, let Fitzgerald rule Ireland. Many legends have grown up around Garrod Moore, including one that relates how he slumbers in a cavern beneath the Curra of Kildare. And he rises every seven years in the month of May to defend Ireland against its enemies. If you're a listener who happens to live around Brownstown, Suncroft, Ballymany, on the edge of the Curra, and you see a bloke in period dress, it could well be Garrod Moore of Minute. His grandson, Silken Thomas, the 10th Earl of Kildare, led a failed uprising against the English garrison in Dublin. And in response, the then English king, Henry VIII, sent over an army to besiege Minute Castle. It is said that on the night before he surrendered, Silken Thomas gained some consolation by playing his harp under a yew tree in the castle grounds. And that nicely leads me from the awesome castle into the grounds of Minute College, where what is to be seen in front of me? The self-same yew tree under which Silken Thomas many centuries ago had played his harp. This yew tree is reckoned to be 800 years old and is recognised by the Tree Council of Ireland as the oldest planted tree on the island of Ireland. Established in 1795 to train Catholic priests, the original St. Patrick's Seminary of Maynooth became the largest seminary in the English-speaking world. And as I advance further into its grounds, I pass under an archway with a sign saying Colin Hall. And this commemorates one of the early Maynooth professors, Reverend Nicholas Cullen, who was a professor in natural science in the college. And who, at a time when people didn't believe there was such a thing as electricity, developed a contraption called the induction coil which became the forerunner of many electrical components in the modern day. In fact, any listener who turns the ignition on her or his car that goes, rrr, 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 that's Nicholas Collins' invention, the induction coil. We go on into St. Joseph Square, which is a quadrangle surrounded by the college buildings, of which the most impressive are the main seminary buildings designed by the architect Augustus Welby Pugin. I must go back to the town itself, back out to the college gate, which leads me to the main street. And in doing so, I'm following in the footsteps of the Minute 15, who in Easter Monday, 1916, marched from the town into Dublin City to take part in the Easter Rising. They were the only Kildare contingent to see action during Easter week. The Minute men led by Donal O'Bukla, marched into the city and were in the thick of the fighting in the GPO. Donal O'Bukla, in the 1930s, Eamon de Valera appointed him the last Governor General of Ireland. Dev was winding down the legacy of the British Crown. We go on to the junction in the main street of Maynooth, which might be called the Roost Junction because the well-known licensed premises of that name 
And if this road junction, I can go to the left, which brings me up Mill Street, named after the former Kavanagh's Manor Mills, now occupied by the Manor Mills Shopping Centre. Opposite it is St Mary's Catholic Church. And further on the road goes out to Lara Bryan, the very old church site and cemetery. If I go back to the Ruth Junction, I can go to the right down to Leinster Street, which takes me to the picturesque triangular harbour of the Royal Canal. That's the same Royal Canal that Brendan Behan wrote, the old triangle goes jingle jangle along the banks of the Royal Canal. Well, you can do your own jingle jangle along the Royal Canal at Maynooth. Now that it's part of the newly launched Greenway and you can walk or cycle eastwards to Leakslip and the Metropolis or westward to Kilcock and the Midlands. Just beyond then the canal is the railway, which was built by the Midland Great Western Railway in 1845. I return to the Roost Junction and I proceed down the main street of Maynooth, which, with its wide footpaths and tree-lined pavements, has a touch of class and a touch of style. And as befits a town which evolved around the Fitzgerald estate. And at the eastern end of the main street, I walk into Carton Avenue, a tree-lined walk, a public, if you like, legacy from the great estate. And that brings me onto the Dunboyne Road, from which I can access the Carton estate proper. Now, the Fitzgeralds were associated with the castle in Maynooth up till about the 1600s, when it was ruined for the second time. Then sometime down in Kilkay Castle, between Castle Termit and Athai, but then came back to Maynooth. And when they came back, they came back in style, because they commissioned the building of the great Carton House, a Palladian mansion. This was commissioned by the 19th Earl of Kildare, and he commissioned the architect Richard Cassell. He also commissioned Cassells to build Leinster House, which, of course, is the seat of the Irish Dáil and Senate. The Fitzgeralds, by the late 1700s, owned three impressive properties. Carton was their country house, Leinster House was their city house, and Frascati House in Blackrock was their summer house. They were also elevated to the dukedom in the peerage of Britain and Ireland. The first Duke of Leinster married Lady Emily Lennox, who brought her own extraordinary characteristics to the Fitzgerald family. Lady Emily had access to the highest aristocratic and political circles in Britain and Ireland. She was also the mother to 19 children, and in between all that, found time to complete the interior decoration of Carton House, including the impressive Chinese room, which can be seen to the present day. The Fitzgerald's presence in the Maynooth area and indeed in Leinster as a whole continued right through the 1800s. But in the early 1900s, it all began to go wrong. As the 1900s emerged, there were three Fitzgerald brothers. The eldest, Morris, who in the normal circumstances would inherit it, had an illness of the mind and was confined to a hospital in Edinburgh for his short life. So hopes rested on the second brother, Desmond. The First World War broke out in 1914, and he joined the British Army and ended up being killed in a training accident behind the lines when he picked up a piece of ammunition and it exploded. So that meant that the title of properties went to the third brother, Edward. Edward was a chancellor, a gambler. He gambled away his money on wine, women and song and mortgaged his inheritance of the Leinster estate. Eventually, the mortgage was called in by an English industrialist known as Malaby Dealey, and the Leinster estates were lost to the family. The title continues, and there is a Duke of Leinster, the ninth Duke, who lives a relatively low-profile life in England and occasionally visits Ireland. I suppose when we think of Maynooth, we think of it as being, in many ways, a, a male bastion, if you like. That was to change momentarily on a day in February 1879 a figure who it would seem maybe a long way away from these parts. And she was the Empress Elizabeth of Austria and Hungary, who had married the Emperor Franz Joseph when she was just 15 in the mid-19th century. And over the following years, she became the Princess Diana of our time. She found court life in the Imperial Palace in Vienna very difficult. It was so strict. 
She travelled incessantly throughout Europe. And one of her travels brought her in February 1879 on a hunting expedition to Ireland, where she stayed in Summer Hill House, just a few miles north of Kilcock. And she was out with the Ward Union hunt one day, hunting on the terrain on the Kildare Mead boundary, when she became detached from the main hunting party and her horse found its way into the grounds of Maynooth College. In some way, the staff recognised who she was. The college president was summoned, the best china was fetched, and she was entertained to tea. She would have got a warm reception there because she was a Catholic princess. But in any event, she returned anyway to her hunting party and nothing more was heard until some months later, a big parcel arrived from the continent. And when it was opened in Maynooth, it was found to contain a set of clerical vestments embroidered with the arms of Austria and Hungary and with shamrocks. And this was Elizabeth's gift to Maynooth for the hospitality she had received. Elizabeth, or as she became popularly known in the press as Sissy, story was to end tragically. Almost 20 years later, she was still on her travels, this time to Geneva. And in town that same day was a French anarchist. And tragically, he stabbed her and she died. I like to think that maybe somebody remembered how 20 years earlier, Sissy Elizabeth of Austria and Hungary had brought a cosmopolitan glamour to the otherwise austere clerical corridors of Venice.